I want to go back to when you did first start, you know, getting involved with music, then with saxophone. And as you're talking about that, um, I'm going to be curious as to, you know, when you started first playing classical pieces, if, you know, that was during, you know, your, your younger days, like, you know, middle school, high school, or if that started to happen in college, which were those pieces and recommendations you would have for people um, in terms of like, no pun intended, but key pieces to play if they were like beginners or intermediate or advanced? Yeah. So um, I, I would say that I, I started playing classical music before, um, you know, at the beginning, but I, I was more so just like trying to play saxophone, like, you know, like I was, you know, like anyone else, I, I started in band with the, you know, the essential elements, like books and whatever, you know, in like sixth grade and whatever. Um, but um, I, you, I think I, where did you grow oh, up? Go ahead. Oh, in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, but I, I wouldn't say that I really got into classical repertoire per se until my junior year of high school, sophomore, junior year of high school, because I went, I ended up going to the North Carolina School of the Arts, which is a, um, you know, a, it's a college that also has a high school boarding, boarding program. Um, and so that's when I really started getting my, my butt kicked, you know, in terms of like learning all the pieces and my scale patterns and whatever. Um, and so I wouldn't necessarily recommend that people do all of the things that I did because when I first started playing classical saxophone, I was trying to get into the school of the arts and I actually played the Paul Creston Sonata, which is a very common piece for us. But I, one, I think that's too hard for a beginner Two, I was playing it on tenor saxophone and it's written for alto. Like I didn't, I didn't know anything. Like I was just like, <laughs> this is like a classical thing. Like, <laughs> um, so, and so I don't know that I wouldn't necessarily tell people to do that, but, um, now that I'm a little more informed, um, I think that there for okay so in the beginning stages of of playing the saxophone there are a lot of choices that you sort of have to make because it's really common for people to get really good at their digital technique like moving their fingers being able to play quickly and then they want to play music that is too hard too soon um and i think that's common probably in every musical field like you want to just go on too fast um but I would recommend that people play things like uh, the Boza aria, uh, Eugene Boza, his aria. Um, there is a book also called, um, I think it's just called Solos for the Alto Saxophonist uh, by Larry Teal. And that book has a lot of transcriptions in it of popular classical melodies. And People often skip over stuff like that, but that is extremely important because those are those books or that book has things with functional harmony, you know, that are that you can actually digest. And so I one of the things that I uh, recommend to students is to not only learn their part, but to at least try to tinker through the piano part or look at the orchestral score for whatever they're playing so that as they're learning theory and learning the basics of just how music works, that they're able to apply that when they're playing. That's one of the real um, disconnects between the saxophone world, like the classical saxophone world and like the string world, for example, if you start a Suzuki program as a four-year-old, you know, on the violin, you're learning in a very like holistic way about like how music works. And I think that a lot of saxophonists start by learning how to play the saxophone and like trying to just 
get better and better at saxophone stuff. Um, but I would recommend that people really take some time to work on bass level stuff and to learn how to make that stuff seem really, really good. Um, so those are, those are two places to go. Um, then for, and there's these, the definitions for all these terms are also very different beginner, intermediate, you know, um, advanced, but I guess for like a, um, you know, a pretty good high schooler that that's wanting to play some more, um, challenging repertoire. Um, first of all, I would recommend jumping into, um, etude books. So things like the, the Fairling etudes, um, or, uh, Marcel Mule also has some etude books. Um, that are really good. And the reason I'm saying these is because, again, there's a lot in there that is more technically demanding, but is still um, digestible for you to understand, like, as, as a musician. Um, I think that a lot of, um, a lot of people start diving in at that point um, two things like the Creston Sonata or um, the um, a lot of our French repertoire, Boutry Divertimento, uh, it's Roger Boutry, um, Alfred Dazenclos Prelude, Cadence and Finale. Um, it's really funny now that I'm trying to sit here and think about repertoire. It's like all of the repertoire that I know is <laughs> going out the window. Um, but um, again, these pieces, I think, are a little bit complex for like the young high schooler, you know. Um, so to me, you'd want to be very well versed in uh, in music theory and sort of aural skills, things like that, before you're approaching these pieces, because they they're just very um, complex <laughs> in, in a way. And so they're, but it's really common for younger students to be playing this repertoire as well. Yeah, because it, because some states, um, I'm originally from New York. So with NISMA, mm -hmm. you know, there's there's a repertoire for their um, their yearly solo competitions, whatever you want to call it. And so you're, if you want to get into all state, or if you're going level six, you're going to be playing those pieces. Exactly, exactly. And I mean, in in my perfect future, I envision just a totally different way of doing all of that. I I don't really know what it is, but the the fact that you have to learn these pieces um, so early, and also the fact that you have to that so many people learn their parts, like the saxophone part separate from the music itself, I think is really problematic <laughs> because, um, you know, if you take the Creston Sonata, for example, um, I did uh, a, a masterclass last semester where I went in and I just read through the first page and played, well, basically played the first page of the piano part for my students in class. And I asked if anyone knew what piece it was. Okay. Nobody knew. Mm. And the, the interesting thing to me is that that's as a composer now, as someone that writes music, that is the music, like, <laughs> like the, the, all of it together is the music. And then you, you learn your part, but as a part of this holistic thing, like once you can just basically play your part, you can't necessarily get it to performance level until you understand the interplay. Cause like, yeah, you can play it, right. You can play it, but do you, can you really do it? Like, 
are you doing what the composer was envisioning? Because the composer, at least composers that I know of, are almost never envisioning like a saxophone part. And then they're like, let me plug in some piano stuff. <laughs> right, right, right. You know, so I would, you know, in my, you know, utopia in the future, I would love for there to be some way that students have to demonstrate like a, a more holistic, like musicianship earlier um, in the process before they start playing super advanced pieces. Yeah, you know, going off of that, um, I grew up playing trumpet. So what I would do mm. is I would listen to recordings over and over and over again, then I would get the music. And then I knew mm. I never needed to count when I needed to come in because I knew the piano had this, that statement, boom. And then I had this, this phrase coming in. Um, right. It's, it's it, um, what you're, you know, talking about in terms of, you know, this utopian type of thing, I think it boils down to also changing how we educate, um, how music education in schools. And you're in like, um, for Ithaca College, you're upstate New York and stuff. So uh, between Ithaca, more so Rochester, Buffalo, um, there's a lot of uh, music teachers that are in involved with music learning theory. And it is more holistic um, in the sense that you are, you know, you're using your ears more than your eyes and you're getting, you know, you're, you're getting the whole picture, you know, and then uh, bringing it to whatever you're playing. I think that because music teachers in schools are so pressured to get results, mm -hmm. they have to teach piecemeal, um, you know, make sure that the kids are playing their parts. And you're right, it, you, you lack the appreciation of what you're playing. It's just, oh, I'm just playing my part. And oh, I don't know what the clarinet's doing. I don't know what, you know, the flute is doing. I don't know how the drums are interacting. I thought they just kept the beat. You know what I mean? So right. yeah, it's that whole, it's that whole um, issue there. Yeah. And, you know, the way that it ends up manifesting, I think, is that it, I find that we're sort of, we're almost like robbing students of what's really like what the real genius is of the music um because what I, for me um i mean i didn't learn this utopian way either but like for me everything i i i got much better as a performer and as a teacher when i started composing and when and through the process of learning jazz and improvising and like understanding music in that way. And I also grew up listening to gospel and playing, you know, I, and singing in the choir and things like that. Um, and so like there was just this, the table was set, I guess, for me to f like fall into these things, but for students that don't necessarily just fall into those things, like, there's no, I find that a lot of the students that I interact with don't understand that all of these things are connected. So like when they, when they do study music theory, they don't necessarily understand that the music that they are playing right now is made <laughs> with music theory. <laughs> like, like that, like, so like if they learn about a deceptive cadence, when they play it in the music, they might not feel that there was a deceptive cadence that just happened. They were deceived. Sorry, I had to say that. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Or if, you know, there you go to the Neapolitan or something like, like these things that are actually emotional, you know, and actually like convey something to an audience. If you don't know what it is, then it's really hard to just you know, interpret music. And so then like, if you're only thinking about playing things correctly, like not missing any notes or whatever, then you're missing the whole idea, the whole emotional purpose <laughs> of a lot of different things. Like what does the development section feel like? Okay. But maybe you don't even know that you're in the development. <laughs> yeah. You yeah, know, for sure. Um, for so. sure. And, and, and um, this reminds me of what you said before about the musicians during Mozart's time where, um, Hey, they may have had a lead sheet in front of them, 
right? And but they knew their forms so well that they could converse and have a musical conversation with each other and create a work of art, you know, and right. I think, um, you know, our I think it's a societal thing too. you know, it's all about um, perfecting our part, perfecting our part. But the people that are at the top of their game, you know, a plus level musicians, uh, artists, all that kind of thing. It's more holistic. It's it's really seeing the bigger picture, you know, for what it mm -hmm. is. And that's what gets them to that level. And, and speaking of getting to that level. So, um, you know, you talked about uh, in terms of your, your your growing up and stuff like that, playing certain types of pieces and whatnot. Um, as you're in high school and then thinking about college, um, you know, can you talk about those experiences? And then when you did at Indiana University decide, you know, what made you decide to go the classical route? Mm. Yeah, so I actually had that sort of conversation with myself, classical jazz, whatever, it, when I was in high school, um, because then I would say I was by the time I got to my senior year, I was pretty well versed in both genres, you know, for a high school senior. Um, and so like I had a list, I had a classical school list and I had a jazz school list. Um, and I was really lucky to have a great teacher, Tamar Sullivan, in my last two years of uh, of, of high school. So he helped me with that. Um, and so I ultimately decided to go the classical route um, because that's just that was that was the music that spoke to me like that. That's just how I emote. I don't I, it's hard to describe it. You know, it's like. Um, but even to this day, I still like feel bad sometimes because I'm like a saxophone player and people are like, I think people expect you to be a, at a certain level as a jazz player. And I'm just like, I'm really good at classical, I promise. <laughs> but um, but <laughs> anyway, um, so that's when I decided to go the classical route. And so um, by the time I got to Indiana, I did still want to keep some some of my jazz skills going and I wanted to play because um, it had a good program. Like there were some schools that I was thinking about that, like if I went there, I probably wouldn't play jazz anymore. Um, but IU had had a great program and I had uh, connected with uh, some of the people there and I ended up actually getting to take class with David Baker and, oh, wow. you know, and so that was really fun. Um, so I, I was a jazz minor. So I did my saxophone performance degree, but all four years I played in big band, um, played in combo for a couple of years and, um, you know, did, did some gigging outside um, of school. Um, but that's sort of um, how I decided which, which direction I was going to go in. Let's, um, let's talk about because you did both and you still do both you know but it's mostly predominantly classical um we should talk about equipment because i'm pretty sure you didn't use the same equipment you know going from big band right. <laughs> to your chamber music or concertos yeah um should we start with a specific horn you think or let's let's do this let's talk about um if we can go back and talk about like, you know, during high school, what kind of equipment were you using in terms of horn, mouthpiece and reed, um, and perhaps even ligature. And then as you got to college, how that may have changed. And, you know, um, you know, what you were doing in terms of classical and jazz, and then leading into now what your equipment is. So in in high school, um, on on alto i guess i mean by the time i got to my um i started playing actually i started playing alto my senior year of high school um because most of the repertoire was for was for alto that i would maybe be doing for auditions and stuff so i was playing um i think i was playing an al3 a van doren al3 um probably with van doren reeds um, and I was actually, I didn't own an alto, so I was using the school's instrument at the time, um, which was a very nice instrument. It was oh. a Selmer series three. Oh, um, yeah, That's it was, rare. I mean, it was an art school. So like okay. they, it, they, they knew what was what, uh, and I don't even, I don't remember the ligature, maybe a Van Doren MO or, 
something. I wasn't really worried. I didn't really understand like what a setup was <laughs> at that time. Like my teacher was sort of like, this will work for you. Um, so, and I was able to kind of get what I wanted out of it. You know, um, I didn't really understand how important it was. Um, then in college, if I keep going with alto, I, um, I play, I had two setups in college. I, I used an, uh, an S90, um, one, that's a Selmer S90. What was it? Uh, I think it was a 190, 190 facing, I think. Um, and then I went back to the AL3 because my teacher at the time, um, Otis Murphy, Dr. Otis Murphy, um, was like a big proponent. He was probably the, the biggest proponent of the Van Doren AL3 at that time. Okay. For those that don't know, that the AL3 um, is a really good mouthpiece for, I, I, I guess I would say for, um, I don't want to say beginners, but for people that want a lot of control built in to the mouthpiece. So it's going to get you pretty good intonation, pretty round sound. It's going to get you all of the things that we generally want or think are, you know, good things for a classical sound without too much um, controlling effort that you'll have to go use. Um, and so for, for, for me at the time, it allowed me to do all the things that my teacher wanted me to do. Got it. Okay. Um, and so I guess it wasn't really until my master's though, that I started to think about like, what do I want my setup to do? Like, <laughs> what am I, what am I really trying to get at here? So I actually did a, uh, an independent study in my master's, um, which for me was a fancy way of saying like, how do I fix my playing? <laughs> because I was getting ready to be a professional. I was getting ready to leave school. And I was like, I still have a lot of problems <laughs> in my playing and I don't want to be a professional and have trouble with low register articulation. Like I, I don't want to be a professional and not know how to fix all the problems that I, that I had because I wouldn't have a teacher anymore. <laughs> and so like, I was like in my last semester with my teacher, I want to just dive in and fix stuff, like really fix it. Not like, Oh, and in, in a few years I'll be able to No, I want to fix it. <laughs> and so um, at that point I started to then really understand how sound is made. Like, how does it really work on the saxophone? Like, and so then I realized a lot of my issues, you know, like basic stuff, like the reed vibrates against the mouthpiece and then the instrument amplifies that sound. Okay. That seems really basic, but almost every time I talk to one of my students or a student that I don't know, um, their the bite point that they have, like where they're, their embouchure, you know, is or when the, where their bottom lip is touching the reed is closer to the mouthpiece than where the reed and mouthpiece split. Yeah. And so if you understand that inherently, then you'll know that you're dampening the vibrations of the reed if you do that. And so like I wanted to find a setup that I could play on without dampening the vibrations of the reed that I would get the sound that I wanted easily. So you know how people say, oh, you can play on anything and like it, you'll still sound like you. I like don't think that that's true <laughs> because, because every mouthpiece, every piece of equipment has a natural way of being. Sure, you can get to something eventually, like if you're manipulating things so if you like change how you voice or you change um you know maybe how much mouthpiece you have in your mouth or you change your articulation you can maybe get to a certain thing but what i'm looking for in a setup is something where i can do everything 
in a way that I know is natural and then get the sound immediately out of my instrument that I want to have. So, so that I don't have to constrict the reed or over voice or use too much muscle um, to get the sound that I want. So the only mouthpiece, the truly the only classical mouthpiece that I've found for me does that is the Diderio um, D155 uh, reserve mouthpiece. And not a ton of people actually play on this mouthpiece, but um, when I blow through it, <laughs> I don't have to do anything different. <laughs> um, and I can just, it, it gives me a round sound that feels very vocal to me. Um, it's very important to me, like when with a free, with free reed vibration, it's very important to me to feel like the air is flowing, you know, in the same way as it would if I was singing. And so this is a mouthpiece that allows me to feel that airflow without the sound getting really sort of spread or like too open. It's still controlled and round, um, but has a nice airflow to it. Um, and so, yeah, I use that. And I also use the Diderio Reserve Reeds um, size three on that mouthpiece, which I actually went down from some of the other things that I played before. Um, and I use a Silverstein Hexa ligature on, on that. Um, and now the horn that I use is a Selmer Series 2, um, just brass lacquer with, uh, and I use a actually a S series three sterling silver neck Interesting. um with that um and i have some other doodads and gadgets that i use i, I use the meridian winds center brace bell weight um which in in truth it really the only thing that it is technically is added weight to the instrument but i actually find that that gives me a little bit more resistance uh, in a different way than like a harder read. It's like a more um, uh, hardy resistance in a way. And it doesn't actually affect like how my read feels. Um, okay. So I use that. Um, and then I also use the La Freaks, um, which are, I think they'd refer to them as sound bridges. Um, and it's a, um, it's not actually a super complex concept. <laughs> the the La Freaks are um, little pieces of metal that come in different like finishes and, and types of metal that connect all of the different parts of the saxophone that either come apart or at one point were not together. So most of the time people use this um, from the mouthpiece to the neck of the instrument, they'll connect, uh, they'll use the freak to connect the mouthpiece to the neck. But, um, I have performed actually with one from the neck, from the mouthpiece to the neck, the neck to the body, and then the body to the bow and the bow to the bell. I so with, no, they made all yeah. those. I know about the mouthpiece to the neck. Wow. Well, it, it's basically the same thing, um, but with different bands, you know, that, that you hook them on with. Um, and sometimes you need different lengths. Um, so I think there are three different lengths. There's like a smaller, a medium, and then one that's big, that's for like double reeds normally, but um, it can, it can also work on the saxophone. Um, and the more connections that there are, the more I have that feeling that I was talking about before, where when I blow, the airflow just goes through the instrument. There's no, I, I guess the best comparison I could give is if, if, if you play baritone saxophone, I can, when I play baritone, I can feel the loop, <laughs> that loop at the top. I can feel it when I blow in because the airflow is not the same as when I'm, playing, you know, soprano or something where it could just zing right through the instrument. 
So with the Lafreaks, I feel like that is optimized even more so that I'm able to get maximum airflow with least resistance uh, or with the least amount of effort, I guess I would say. Okay. Um, so I can, I find that I can project not necessarily more, but I can project easier without having to like, feel like I'm really blowing my brains out. It's like the sound inherently is just more, is just bigger. <laughs> um, even when, even in the softs, like it's still present, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, um, let yeah. me interject for one second. This is interesting to me because I've actually, I've, um, I know about the Lafreaks. I actually have one myself. I've heard the difference. I've absolutely mm -hmm. heard the difference. Did not know about the other parts of the horn. Um, that I didn't know that you could use Lafreaks so they had uh, different size bands for the other parts of the horn. But uh, the Meridian Wind Center Brace Bellweight, that I didn't know about. So I'm wondering, do mm. you feel you need that because with the Lafreaks, you know, um, it's, it's more, it kind of makes the horn a little bit more free or blowing and you feel like you need that little extra resistance because of the Lafreaks. I'm wondering if you need one because of the other. I don't think so. Um, there's, um, it's so hard to talk about sound. <laughs> it's so hard to talk about sound and feel. Um, but I think that um, the Lafreaks for me deal more with, the the like the what i call the glow of the sound like there's an in i feel like it's easier for me to get that sweet glow that you get Som sometimes when you're playing like mezzo piano mezzo forte where the reed is not being pushed um but it's vibrating just right you know um it's not like you're blowing really hard but it just feels good and I feel like the Lafrique allows me to have that glow for a wider range of dynamics. So in the piano, I still feel glow. And in Fortissimo, I'm still feeling glow and not feeling like, oh, I'm really pushing. And then with the center brace bell weight, it's more about um, the, um, like the, density of the airstream um, or even of the sound maybe um, where it's not it's more so inside the actual core of the sound rather than the glow that's projecting Got it. into okay. the audience <laughs> does that make any sense yeah yeah it does <laughs> no, this is it is fascinating when you think about this and you know there there are I know classical musicians are even everybody, you know, of course, wants the best tone, but mm -hmm. I, I've seen a lot of classical musicians who are really, really, in, uh, you know, uh, into, um, I don't want to call it these gadgets, but, you know, using mm -hmm. these types of materials to really enhance the tone and get right. the most out of it. Yeah. Well, and here's the other thing too, that I should mention, like whenever I'm trying equipment, um, I almost always actually use a spectrograph or a spectrogram. Um, I use an app called Spectrum View and it allows you to, you know, play and just and actually see the overtones in your sound. And to it's it's something that um, I use a lot with my students, uh, but I also use it for myself. So instead of having to describe to someone like a darker sound or whatever, I can just play you know for my student and say this is the kind of sound you're getting right now see what it looks like on this graph this is what i'm looking for do you see how different the overtone curve is and you know all of those kinds of things how can we make that happen so when i'm using these different pieces of equipment i have an overtone curve that i know that i like for my own sound and so when I play something and I just play naturally, not trying to change anything, if the equipment gives me more of the natural curve that I want, then I use it. <laughs> and, it and, and more easily. So like when I played the D'Addario mouthpiece for the first time, it was the first, it was literally the first time that I had ever seen the curve without having to manipulate anything. 
it was like, oh, that is just an unnatural um, uh, decay into the upper overtones. And it's super, su su a super even sort of uh, descent from the fundamental into the upper overtones. Yeah, that's what I want. <laughs> Oh, and wow. then it just worked. <laughs> you know, it's funny because I know about the um, when I was growing up, we used the strobe, the um, the strobe tuners, right? And mm -hmm. I have the iStrobosoft um, tuner app, which helps you to see whether you have core to the sound. Um, mm -hmm. I never heard of uh, the Spectrum View app, so I got to look that up. That's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I've this was one of the things that I came across in my independent study because I. I've realized that I needed to have actual ways to measure things and to think about things so that it wasn't so voodoo, <laughs> you know, it's like, oh man, it's, it's like a darker sound or it's a, you know, it's so this, it's so that, um, I needed to know what my sound was and like how to replicate it. And it ended up making me better as a teacher, um, because then I could explain very specifically and show very specifically things to my students rather than saying, you know, well, you know, in 10 years, you'll have, you know, what you need. It's like, no, like we can change these specific things and then it will sound better. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 you know, it's interesting too, this ties all the way back to the beginning when we were talking about the mics and the ribbon mics. And I'm sure mm. your independent study certainly informed you know, the type of sound that you wanted and the sound you were looking for from your, from your microphones, from that equipment. Oh yeah. I always look at the, at the specs for the microphone and I'm looking at that graph that they include. And I want the one that looks the most like the sound that I want. Yeah. That's, That's an actual great. comparison I make. <laughs> what a great tip. Holy cow. Um, so I, I know we've, we've been on for quite a while here, but if you wouldn't mm. mind indulging us a little bit longer, your um, equipment for your other horns. Sure. Um, so on soprano, I play um, a concept, Selmer concept mouthpiece with um, D'Addario Reserve size four reeds. Um, I find that I have to use harder reeds on soprano. Um, I'm not 100% sure why that is, but <laughs> I, it gives me the, the sound that I want. And also a Silverstein ligature, uh, but I think it's the uh, Estro. And I play on a Yanagisawa solid silver um, uh, uh, 992. I'm forgetting what the first word, what the first letter is. It's a 992. Um, and um, on tenor, I have a Yamaha uh, custom EX and, but also with a silver neck, uh, silver, uh, silver V1 neck. You can tell I like silver. <laughs> I'm going to um, ask you about that yeah. in a minute. Yeah. I have a question for you about um, that. <laughs> and also the concept, Selmer concept mouthpiece um, for solo stuff, for orchestral stuff this is solo like with piano or solo in front of an orchestra for orchestral playing though. I use a Selmer S 90 180. Um, if slightly different sounds. Um, and then um, I use on the concept, I use D'Addario reserve three and a half on the S 90. I use D'Addario reserve four um, both with the Silverstein uh, Estro. And on baritone, I have a Yanagisawa B992. So I guess the soprano is an S992, but that just sounds so wrong to me. It just, I, I can't remember. Uh, um, B992, also with a silver neck and um, an S90 mouthpiece 180 um, with Legere uh, 3.5 reed. Uh, and a uh, Silverstein Estro as well on there. So Okay. All right. So this opened up a whole can of, of worms here. All right. So <laughs> two questions I'm going to ask you. Differences between silver um, and, let's say, lacquer, uh, whether mm -hmm. it's the neck, whether it's the horn body or both or whatever, but also um, that – and I, I do use Legere signature reads. Um, the fact that you use Legere on the – Barry, 
uh, but not on the others. So dive into mm -hmm. that. <laughs> sure. So par partially it's logistical because I'm in a saxophone quartet called Canary and our entire quartet uses Legere. And we started using Legere. I, I guess technically I was the first one that started playing Legere. Um, but well, I started playing Legere because we were in a competition once and it was our first competition and I was playing a cane read and it warped during the performance. Oh my God. <laughs> Literally there by the end of it, I could not play any notes and I just felt so embarrassed. It was awful. Um, the reads are just so big, you know, the berry reads are just so big that they, you know, they can turn into a canoe <laughs> really quickly. Um, so I, I just, honestly, I started just making Legere's work even before they were really good. Um, and now they're just fantastic. Like they're really good. And our whole, like people are always so surprised when they find out that our whole quartet uses them. Soprano, alto, tenor, berry. Um, our soprano player, I've never seen, I've never heard anyone sound that good on a, on a Legere on soprano. I can't do it. I don't know how he does it. He sounds amazing. Um, it's Bob Eason. Um, so that's basically, that's actually sort of why I don't switch away in a way, because we have this group sound that's sort of based on playing Legere. <laughs> um, um, and even when I try to play cane reads again on Barry, I just can't find, it doesn't have that natural feeling. It's like, I can always tell when the, when the back of the reed like is not super flat. You know, because on Legere, it's just always so flat. <laughs> and then, you know, on Kane, it just changes too much for how big the read is. Wow. And, um, and with yeah. the Legere reads on Barry, how long, um, how long do they last for you, each one? A really long time uh, because really? I have okay. a, I have a lot of them. <laughs> <Okay>. um, so <laughs> I, I, I rotate them. Um, I probably have. I have like eight or nine that I keep in rotation and I'm just, I've in terms of performance reads, um, I still perform on one that is probably like three or four years old. Wow. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, and yeah, and they, it doesn't change as much because I don't play on it all the time every day. Um, so yeah okay. um but for the 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 silver um thing it's for me it's all about that glow again um that i like to have in a hull and so what i find is that when i'm playing on a brass instrument it sounds fine you know but then when i go into a hull and i play the same dynamic level with the same amount or lack of push in the sound, like it just feels distant. Like it feels like it's on, like it's, it's, um, it doesn't go past me playing it. Or if I'm in the audience, it would sound like, Oh, he's playing the saxophone over there on the stage with the silver. And this, it can be explained in projection terms too, like through the spectrogram and everything. But with the silver, I feel like at that same, with that same level of effort, the sound it projects in a way that is like around, like it's around the hall rather than up there on the stage. Um, and that's without having to do a lot more or, or to exert a lot more effort. Um, to do that. And so that's actually why I don't super love gold plated stuff because I find that with the gold plating, it, it creates a beautiful sound, but um, for me, it's almost too covered in a way or too, too rounded in a way that like it gets back to that idea of like, that's a really nice, great core of the sound over there. <laughs> um and so I want to have a sound that is more like a singer almost where it like envelops the audience 
like in the sound that's happening. And so, but I also don't want to have to blow my brains out. So for sure, for sure. And yeah. I, I, I love the way you describe that envelops. I, I can, mm -hmm. I can picture that. I can feel that. And my, my question too, with this, does it matter um, that the horn, the whole horn is not silver. It's just the neck that's silver. Or are you talking the whole horn should be silver? What's your experience with that? I mean, I prefer for the whole horn to be silver, but sometimes my financial situation does not allow for that. I mean, that is expensive, you know. Uh, even the the equipment that I have already is just like I'm like, why do I have all this stuff? But um, yeah, so the closer, like you know, the closer the thing is to the origin of the sound, the more of a difference it makes, which is why most people have like that first Lafrique right there um that i think hans who is the inventor of the lafrique he says it's like 70 percent of the way there if you just have the first connection you know and then with each one you fill in the rest of it um and so like if i i'd rather have a silver neck than a silver than and in a brass body than a, a silver body and a brass neck okay um so that's why I've gone with the neck for most of them. And then on the soprano, the whole thing is silver. Um, so, yeah. And do you, um, in, in terms of the, uh, the, the Lefrex, um, do you use them on all your horns? And do you feel that with a silver neck, do you still feel like you need the Lefrex? Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't say that it's like a need, right? It's It's more like, Oh man, I really miss the Lafrique. Like, <laughs> like okay. that's you know that's that would that would really make that easier in here. I would have to do that with less effort, you know, if I'm using the, if I was using that. Um, so I generally use use them on on all of my horns, but if I'm playing a concert where I play all four, I'm not going to be transferring them, you know, between every piece from this horn to the next one, and I, you know. Again, I don't want to buy like 50 million of them. <laughs> okay, got it, got it. Okay, I thought you had a separate, separate each. Okay, got it. Yeah, because it's oh, no. crazy expensive. So like, yeah, it, it really does. So when I play, on, like when I play a concerto and it's just alto or something, I load them up. You know, I've got them all the on all of the um, connections. But when I played my, when I play a recital, you know, I might have, um, I actually usually, have one on alto um one on tenor one on baritone no no no. sorry two on alto one on tenor one on baritone and none on the soprano because it's all silver and for whatever reason that one i don't feel like i need it as much because in a hall it, it's already just like bing. <laughs> um so, so um but if I were only playing soprano, I would still use it um, just to make it a little bit uh, easier. This is great. Listen, this this has been really fascinating. You shared so many great tips and we could we could talk for hours more, um, <laughs> which it, it's because this is really so much fun and, and it's fascinating. But before I let you go, people need to know where to find you online. We talked briefly before about your YouTube um, channel where it's Stephen Banks Saxophone and it's the same thing on Facebook. But what about your website um, if you're on Instagram or Twitter or anything like that? Sure. Uh, my website is stephen-banks.com. And I, I sell my compositions through there too. So if people want to buy them, they can find them there. Um, currently I have um, a piece for baritone saxophone called As I Am, a piece for tenor saxophone called Come As You Are. And then I've written a, uh, a cadenza for the Glazunov Concerto that I mentioned earlier um, that, that's on there. And um on Instagram, I'm Stephen Banks Saxophone, <laughs> um, and I think that's all of my stuff. I yeah, I don't really use Twitter or anything like that. It's funny because Twitter used to be the thing, and now it's kind of, kind of you know um, not as used, so to speak, for you know musicians and stuff like that. Um, yeah. Do you have you know recordings that you sell? Are they also on your website? I don't. Um, I don't currently have any solo 
you know, professional recordings, but my quartet has a recording of um, a lot of the French standards in the quartet repertoire um, that's on Naxos. You can also, you can also find it, you can find it on Spotify. If you, if you look uh, for Canary Quartet, it's K-E-N-A-R-I. Um, and yeah, I think the best place to, to look for recordings for me is on my YouTube. Um, and occasionally I put them on Instagram and Facebook too. You'll, you'll have to, uh, I'm just putting this out there for you. You'll have to have a future project where you do your own CD of either your own works or your works interspor- interspersed with, uh, with others. That's a dream. That's a dr- That's what I want to do. And, um, I have some other pieces that I, that I've written that aren't quite published yet. And so I really want to have my first CD actually be all of my, <laughs> all of my stuff. I think that would be such a cool thing. You know, it's like, it, it's really common, you know, like sort of on the jazz side to like write your own tunes. And so I, I kind of like to just write my own tunes in a way. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So I'd, I'd love to do that. And you'll have to you have to uh, keep us informed, you know, as this as I'm telling you to do this project <laughs> you <can> keep us <laughs> informed about yeah. when that's going to happen. So we could, you know, we could absolutely help you promote it. But um, listen, Stephen, thank you so much. You've been so generous with your time and um, so many great things that you shared. Uh, we really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. This was fun. Mm-hmm.